Hello and welcome to the Talking City podcast. I'm your host today, Seb Parkinson, and it really helps that I am the producer of this podcast. So we're going to talk in part two about some of the questions from the fans, something I'm really excited to talk about. But in part one, we're going to review the the international break, really, that's uh, that's just, just finished. And then in part three, we're going to talk about the Arsenal game upcoming. And um, like John Stones, uh, Joe, I didn't didn't really know it was a coming this Sunday. So um, <laughs> without further ado, let's get into it. England How did played you not know it was Belgium. coming? It's all we've been talking Obviously. about. I know, it's all we've been <laughs> talking about. Um, yeah, without further ado, Manchester, uh, Manchester City, England played Belgium in a, in a game on Tuesday evening in a game where John Stones and Phil Foden and Jeremy Doku played. Joe, just want to run through your findings and takings from that game and how it affects Sunday's game, if at all. I can't really tell you how well anyone played because I listened to more of it than I watched. But obviously, the sight of John Stones hobbling off and uh, suffering a a doctor injury, which I still don't know what it is, (laughs) an adductor. I was trying to uh, research that today, but... um, it doesn't sound great in terms of uh, Stones and it's one of them like if Harry Maguire was fit would Stones have started if Kyle Walker was fit would he have if, I don't know Guardiola said before the international break be careful be sensible but England didn't really have any other options and that back four when Stones was off was very very inexperienced and you can't imagine any of them will start or play much of a part in the Euros but yeah, seeing John Stones go off is sort of compounded what hasn't been a good international break for City. It was good to see Phil Foden again play uh, in sort of the middle, continue that developing partnership with Jude Bellingham, which could be quite exciting. And the fact that he didn't get injured is obviously a positive. Um, Jeremy Doku looked like he was causing trouble and building on the sort of performances that he had from City uh, just before the international break. And there were some positives, but I think massively overshadowed by a potential injury to Stones, which adds to Kyle Walker. You've got the three players who remained in uh, City in the international break. We'll talk, I think Akanji and Mateus Nunes didn't play because they picked up problems. It's not really been an ideal break for, for Guardiola. Yeah, you've done a piece this morning. Gareth Southgate's spiky response to John Stone's injury as seven Man City players doubted against Arsenal. So that's worth checking out. It's funny, it's interesting to think that this time last season, City had just got their full strength squad back. So it's sort of like a an opposite of of, of how City were facing up uh, this, this point last season. But just looking at an adductor injury. So this is from the National Institute of Health. An adductor injury typically occurs when the athlete pushes off in the opposite direction as a result, the adductor muscles contract to generate both eccentric and concentric opposing forces. The dominant leg is more commonly injured and more likely to sustain significant injury. Now, prior to the game, Jeremy Doku was asked what was going on in the City WhatsApp group, and he just sort of said that Carl Walker expects to be back. So with the fact that Edison, uh, Edison obviously didn't go to international break with Brazil, and um, Kevin De Bruyne are out, Carl Walker's out, how many of these people you sort of anticipate may be available against Arsenal on Sunday? I think Guardiola said before that De Bruyne, Grealish and Edison are expected back this week. We've seen De Bruyne and Grealish. There's a picture of them in training congratulating the women's players for a very good win in the in the derby to keep up their title challenge in the in WSL. So if they're back in training, that's positive. That shows that they're on schedule. And I think with Grealish, especially Guardiola said he's got a 10-day training plan and he was on the bench against Newcastle you would you would assume that that's stayed to to plan uh, we're recording this on Wednesday so Guardiola will give a better update on Friday when when he faces the media um, it's, I, I would guess assuming that all those players are sort of on schedule uh, in terms of De Bruyne, Edison, Grealish that they will be in contention whether it's from the start you just don't know um, Walker there are reports that he might be Fit, he might be 50 50. It's, it's not, we, we never know, do we? And I think there's always a bit of a, a a difference between England's level of fitness and cities. And England have to or want to get these players fit for two games in a week. City are looking further ahead, and Guardiola has been doing that. He, he named all the, the games three days apart before the international break and said, Be careful. So we were saying earlier in the week on the other podcast, do you keep Walker? 
behind just to make sure he's definitely fit for Real Madrid. We were saying that when we thought that Stones and Akanji could be very able deputies and now those two have uh, what we believe is issues. It, it does make it a little bit more difficult. I think the back four as it stands for Arsenal, taking away the injuries is uh, Rico Lewis, Josco Gavardio, Ruben Diaz and Nathan Ake. It's strong on one side, maybe a bit weak on the other. It's it's not the back four you want to be facing in a in a title showdown. So I think they will be hoping that Akanji's just been rested and he can recover from his knock. Stones isn't too bad, but again, Stones is one who's had so many problems, you don't want to rush him back. Yeah, and I think before the international break, some of the City players, I think it, I think it was Rodri, but correct me if I'm wrong, was talking about the idea that these games <laughs> are only friendlies and mm-hmm. that the players need to go out there and not be too intense, but obviously it's hard for a footballer to not give their all. So, you know, seeing some players getting injured is a bit frustrating, especially with, like you say, with, with Arsenal, so if, if they were playing a team like, you know, Luton Town or something where it's potentially less important, you could probably gloss over it a little bit. But with it being Arsenal, it being such a big game, and having some key potentially key players out is is a bit of a a bit of a worry for City fans. But where do you think City are at? Do you still think do you think that these injuries could derail the season, or do you think it's it's something that Pep Guardiola has experience with managing and can sort of utilize you know the rest of his squad to to get a result? They'll always find a way, won't they? They've got they've not got a big squad, but they've got a good squad of versatile players, and it's it could be that, for example, Akanji and Nunes have been rested and just not risked and I think Southgate made the point that yes Walker and Stones went off in the opening stages of their games but they weren't the most intense games and he defended his right to play them and pointed to Ake and Van Dijk and Haaland playing to sort of two get two games in a week for their respective countries and he's not the only one who who plays these players so yeah it, it could be that it's more precautionary but to see I think that's what you can say for the players who were rested and didn't play. When you see Stones and Walker hobble off, having done something and not be, being able to continue, that's a bit more worrying. And they're probably the two players you really don't want out of that defence with Madrid coming up and Vinicius, the, the whole Walker rivalry there. And just the way that Stones transforms that defence, it's it it feels like if those two are injured, say a Kanji doesn't recover, it is going to be quite a third, fourth, fifth choice pairing in in centre back and uh, sort of Rico Lewis who hasn't played a, a, at all really Re- recently he was called up in Walker's place for the England squad but then didn't come off the bench and would he have been better served playing another game for the under 21s just to get some rhythm in it's it's one of them and I think Guardiola sent the players off and said don't get injured and told Haaland that he'd come after them if if they did get injured and he's got seven players who we, d- we just don't know if they fit or not yeah, and it's obviously worrying. And obviously, talk of this double treble continues while City remain in all of the competitions. And I think that the only thing that could potentially derail their own their season is their own injuries. Like I don't mm-hmm. think, you know, I think I worked out that from now to the end of the season, that he could play Arsenal three times, Real Madrid, Chelsea, Spurs, um, all in the sort of next four weeks it's like the, the 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 crunch time of the season and all of these if they don't play Arsenal they play Bayern Munich if they get through against Real Madrid you know they, they play Arsenal once Bayern Munich twice Real Madrid twice Chelsea and then potentially Manchester United in the FA Cup final or Coventry if they get through so you know it, it's 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 this is it this is you and I think we were talking at the beginning of the month about the fact that it's it's the most important month of the year until April it's the most important important month of the year till May so, you know, given the state of play at the moment, what are your thoughts on this double treble? And I think you said on Monday, City will potentially win two out of three. Where, where do you sit with that now with, with the injuries? Well, well, I think we just have to wait and see what Guardiola says, don't, don't we? If, if Walker's back after a game, if Stones only misses a couple of games, then great. I don't think the others are, don't, they don't seem too bad unless Guardiola says differently on, on Friday. I, th- I just think that, that defence looks a little bit weak at the moment against Arsenal, but for all we know, Guardiola can come and say, now, do you know what? It was a bit of a scare, but everyone's everyone's all right. Or he could say one thing on, on Friday and everyone arrives at the end on, on Sunday and everything's fine. And there's, there's that sort of theory online among other fans that City players drop like flies during the international break and miraculously recover. It feels a bit different in terms of, especially Walker and Stones, but yeah, it's, I think time will tell if, 
it's like you said, if, if there was a mid-table team directly after the international break, then you could probably ease your way back in with a, a bit of a experimental defence. The fact that it's Arsenal is going to be a bit different, but in that case, you you maybe just need Rodri and Kovacic to to add another layer to to help the defence. Maybe you play Jack Grealish or Bernardo Silva instead of Jeremy Doku to to track back a little bit and control the ball defend in you in the other half basically rather than uh, sort of allow what could be a weaker defense to to be exposed but it certainly doesn't mean they're going to lose against Arsenal it doesn't mean if they had everyone fit and Arsenal have their own problems it doesn't mean they're going to win it's 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 a it adds a different dimension but it it doesn't mean they're going to lose the title at all no and i think that, that what's in city's favor as well is that city are at home and it's a 4.30 kickoff. So by the time that they kick off, they'll know the Liverpool v Brighton result. Should mm-hmm. Brighton shock the world and get a point or beat Liverpool, then, you know, I'm not that not that I'm predicting a loss, but a loss to Arsenal wouldn't be as detrimental as it would if Liverpool win as well. But with City being at home, you know, the, again, the fans will be on their back. Last time City played Arsenal at home, they won 4-1. Prior to that, it was 5-0 in the Premier League. So City's Arsenal will be coming here well, coming to the Etihad with a, um, you know, with a point to prove, really. But City have got the advantage. If it was at the Emirates, you could say, you know, the injuries and the fact that we're playing Arsenal away could be a bit of a, uh, a bit of a, you know, a sticking point. But I think with with the the fifty odd thousand fans behind City, even if Pep puts out a weaker side, that weaker side is still more than good enough to get a result, whether it's a draw or or a win against Arsenal and as good as Arsenal are I think City have got that experience to be able to potentially to to to, to rule you know to to beat them basically I don't think well I know City have not played a game this season where every single player is fit there's been one game where the only player missing was Sergio Gomez so essentially a full a fully fit squad but they've not had all the options available to them all season De Bruyne's been missing for large portions Stones has been on and off Haaland was missing for a bit um there's been a lot of key injuries and they always find a way to cope. It might be that if there's, if your three right-sided defenders are all injured, that complicates things a little bit, but they they still always, they, they always find a way and they have done last season and the season before there's, pretty much every title win they've had has been characterised by a key player being missing. Last season, we talked about Nathan Ake was missing in the running and, um, and that Akanji had to play at left back. Gundogan was missing for a large portion of the season. Laporte, those, those sort of players. Um, I, I'm, I can think of a lot of examples where key players have been missing, and you think, "Oh my God, how are they going to? How are they going to cope without this player, that player?" They've still done it. They've had the best player injured for half the season, and they're still in the in chance of winning a treble coming up to the end of March. It's it's a disappointing international break in terms of Guardiola making the point of don't get injured and manage your minutes, but it, it's it, he will ex- probably prepare for the worst and expect the worst and just deal with the hand he's been given. I don't think he might have complaints about the schedule. He might, I don't think he'll have a go at Southgate or anything, but he know, he knows the game. He, he said himself that those players aren't his anymore for the 10, 12 days that they're away on international duty. And when you say that, you've got to accept that they can be played, they can be used however they like. Yeah, and just looking at the at the schedule as well, it, it's pretty relentless <laughs> for City now. So it's Arsenal Sunday, four thirty, followed by Wednesday at home. So two home games, which is which is a positive. Wednesday against Villa, which is again uh, be a tough test. Game. Villa aren't no rollovers. Yeah, and then it's Palace away on Saturday before they travel to Madrid for the Tuesday. That's so Wednesday there's not a massive Saturday, amount of break as well, which is not ideal. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so Wednesday 8.15, Saturday 12.30, and then Tuesday. I mean, Wednesday would have been better, obviously, but Tuesday night, then 13th of April at 3 o'clock, as it stands, at home to Luton. Again, that's a game where you look at and think, if he needs to do a bit of rotation, that's when you do it, because they then yeah. play Real Madrid at home three days later or four days later or whatever. On the, on the, I assume that's the Wednesday night, the 17th of April. Then it's... Well, it says Tottenham, but postponed for the Chelsea game. There's the FA Cup. Yeah. Yeah, Then I would say compared to those fixtures, there's a bit of respite because it's Brighton away, Forest away, which are two teams that City should be beating. But again, they're away. So it's the travel aspect of it. Home to Wolves, away to Fulham. And then obviously in between all these fixtures, you'd have the 
you'd have the 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 semi-final of the of the Champions League should City manage to progress which I think we all expect they will but that Real Madrid game is going to be such a fantastic like game I'm really excited for that and I think when they played last year I think they absolutely bowled them over didn't they they absolutely destroyed Real Madrid over two legs but with that Jude Bellingham coming in and and obviously a bit of a new look Real Madrid there's just a bit of a bit of excitement there but um before we I, don't, the I, don't, I don't expect them to beat Real Madrid at all. I think they very much can, but I don't think we can sit here confidently and say they're going to beat Madrid in any game because Madrid just, a, they have that aura about them and they might not be the side that they once were in Europe, but even last season gave them, it was a very close game at the Bernabeu and it took a ridiculous performance from City at, at the Etihad. And you mentioned that schedule, the, the Brighton and Forest games could be shifted very short notice a day before as well to... I think it's a, it, I think it's ten games with three days between each one, at an average. So you've got somewhere it's less than three days, somewhere it's four. The the, champ, the FA Cup semi final will give will mean that City are accumulating a game to play in the Premier League, which almost certainly will have to be played in the final week, which is away at Tottenham, which is not ideal. And you talk about Liverpool playing first, depending on how results are going, City might not go top of the league until the, the last week of the season, just because they'll have that that extra game to to be played and Liverpool and Arsenal will be will have that game uh, on the board where City will have the game in hand so it's it's going to be difficult it's a lot of tough games Chelsea in the FA Cup is probably not the draw they would have wanted because they're not beating them in both meetings this season it's Guardiola is right to be worried and want all his players fit and I think that's why he's making such a, a big point before the international break about please manage your minutes and it's not quite worked out for him well, just looking at Liverpool fixtures as well, they go to Old Trafford again on the 7th of April. So, you know, City fans will be not wanting United to win, but hoping that Liverpool lose that game, uh, which is probably looks like their toughest game of the season towards the end, other than they've got the uh, we've got Tottenham at home and Everton away. But you sort of expect Liverpool would beat those sides. I think with what happened at Old Trafford in the FA Cup, Liverpool will obviously have a point to prove, but obviously it's that it's such a rivalry that, that the United fans will be on the back. And in a way, United could beat Liverpool and hand City the title at the same time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's it's a bit of a double edged sword for for all the fans really, wanting, you know, wanting uh how, how that goes but Joe we'll bring part one to an end there I'm really excited for part two we're going to do the rest of our Q&A section but I've also got some comments from some fans on, on our recent podcast that I want to run by you and I want to get your reaction to because we really enjoy that the fans are commenting on the pod it's really taking off on YouTube so get in the comments on YouTube if you're not and we'll, we'll react to as many as we can uh, within reason and uh, well we'll be back in a second for part two Welcome back to the Talking City podcast with myself, Seb Parkinson, the producer of this podcast and our resident Manchester City writer, Joe Bray. Now, Joe, before we get into the Q&A part two that we couldn't we couldn't get in uh, earlier in the week because it was such a bumper podcast, I want to bring some comments in who uh, from 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 those 11s that you produced uh, on, on, on Monday. I think it yeah. was Monday. I'm a lost with all my days at the minute. Um, one comment which really sort of made me giggle was Simon not picking Sergio Aguero is madness, but not picking Myra as, as right winger in favour of Balotelli is disgusting. <laughs> there have been some quite emotive comments, aren't there? People feel very strongly about this. One person told me on the comments of, we did an article explaining our teams and one person told me that I clearly know nothing about football because I... I chose one player per per nationality, and another one said, "What what a ridiculous idea! Why why would you limit it to it to to one nationality?" And we're, we're thinking that's the point of the the game, if you like. But um, yeah, and I think people have been really interested, haven't they? And uh, a couple of alternative teams as well. Yeah, um, have you put this on your Twitter for people to who who may, who maybe listen to this now, not seeing the article? Is there anywhere that they can find that specifically? Um, I think we put it on our Manchester Evening News and I'm not sure I did tweet it, but uh, if you, the the headline is, uh, if I go up, decisions, disputes, debate and picking the best City 11 since the takeover with one big catch. So uh, yeah, you can have a look at our reasoning why we didn't pick David Silva for either, um, mainly because you have we sort of both felt we had to pick Rodri because it was either Rodri or Fernandinho in defensive midfield and that means that you yeah, 
probably have to pick Edison in goal, but then you can't pick Joe Hart and it all has a knock-on effect to each other. But uh, yeah, there were some interesting comments, I, I, I thought, but uh, also some some alternative teams, which were just, it showed that there is no right answer to, to the, the format, is there? Yeah, well, I'll put the link to this in the in the yeah. description. If you want to go on the Manchester United News website and and re, um, and add to it, we've got SP90 who put Edison, Zabaleta, Diaz, Company, Cancelo, Yaya Torre, Rodri, David Silva, De Bruyne, Aguero, Haaland. There's, a, there's an issue an with that. Team. There's an issue go with on. that in that there's two Belgians, two Portuguese, and two Spaniards. Yeah, so I'm not exactly. sure so, that particular so that has, has understood the assignment. But that's, that's a very it. good point. <laughs> oh he says you haven't understood the team selection rules no <laughs> <laughs> but anyway yeah the next point we had the next comment that I want to bring to your attention hi guys do a team based on those that didn't make it such as Mangala Sinclair Rodwell uh, Boney etc uh, so maybe next international break Joe or probably maybe next season I think the next international break is the Euros is it it will be, yeah, after the end of the season. Yeah. Or if we've got a quiet so maybe, week. But I don't think we're going to have many quiet weeks until the end of the season. No, I don't think so either. Maybe maybe during the off-season then we can look at doing a, a, a players that didn't make it properly at Manchester City. Because there's some good names mm. there. You know, um, Scott Sinclair, Jack Rodwell. I think, is Jack Rodwell still playing over in Australia? Is he? Or is he retired now? I think he was. No, last day early he was. He might have retired now. Uh, moving on then. So one comment that we saw... Now, this was on one of our podcasts we did a few weeks ago where we were talking about the strength of the team. So this comment reads, the midfield is not as strong as it used to be. Therefore, Haaland is not getting a good service that he badly needs. City have not found replacements for players like David Silva, Fernandinho, Gundogan. Perhaps Kovacic is coming up to speed. Not sure about Nunes. Where do you sit on this? Um, I think they probably... You can't replace David Silva, but you've got players like De Bruyne and now Foden and Bernardo. I think they've replaced all the different aspects that he brings. I think Fernandinho has been replaced by Rodri. I think Gundogan's the one who was really, really underrated and it's taken City a while to work out how to get what he brings into the current side. Like the whoever has written this says, Kovacic is getting better and we've talked about that, haven't we? That he is slowly starting to pick up those second balls and keep the pressure on and drive forward. And I think the kovacic Rodri partnership could be one that is very important. But yeah, supply in Haaland is always going to be tricky. Last season, it was two wide wingers and they'd maybe come inside, but the, that would allow the your number eights to drive to the byline and put crosses in. The, we know that City move. They've done that for, for years. That's how they did it this this season it's more how many number 10s can you fit behind Haaland and and sort of play him in and it yeah it might have been a bit more difficult to find him he has been injured a little bit he's not scored the same amount of goals but he scored a lot of goals if he'd scored this amount of goals in his first season everyone would have been saying oh what a what a fantastic signing he is so they can always get better and they know it but I wouldn't say it's too big an issue and when you put a lot of quality players in that midfield they will find a way I do think De Bruyne holds it all together though. So they look so much better when he's there because even if it's not goal going to plan, he's got the ability to break through the lines and create something out of nothing. And he's got he's got that link with Haaland that I don't think anyone else quite has. And we saw that at Luton where it was four goals and four assists for De Bruyne until he, he went off and then Haaland got, got another himself. It's If those two were fit all season, then I think City would be in a little bit of a better position than they are. But considering that they are, as I said before, they're still in in within a point of the Premier League title in a Champions League quarterfinal and an FA Cup semi-final. It's not not too bad. And, and using exactly what you've just said there to read this next comment, this is a very emotional and yeah. very negative comment from a City mm-hmm. fan, not aimed at us, but aimed at the team. And I'm going to read this in full. And, and, <laughs> and I think given where City are, exactly what you've just said, FA Cup semi, European quarters, Premier League, one point off the top. This comment really stood out to me because I'm thinking, how how as a Man City fan, given the fact that they're treble winners, they've won five trophies last season, how are you reacting to the team like this? <laughs> it says, Donkey Doku, Nunes and the others not good enough. KDB after his surgery at his age will never be as good as he's unfit, fat as butter. Don't know what that means. Edison won't be missed. Great baller, but average keeper. 
City are a weak side this season. Our defence is poor. Guardiol too slow for the Premier League. Walker getting older. No cups this season. And I hope I'm genuinely wrong. I think I can answer the, that, that last bit for you. You are. <laughs> I think the only Whether thing that get... person has got right is that Walker is getting older because he is. Yeah. Apart from that, I'm not sure. Some people are just inherently negative, aren't they? And when City set the standards so high and they've just won the treble and it's they're not doing it at a canter again, maybe you think, I, I don't know, like, yeah, we've, we've gone through Doku struggles quite a lot, but he's 21 years old. He's, he's a young lad. He's, he's learning the Premier League and there is a definite player in there. Definitely not a donkey, a, a donkey as, as this guy says. Nunes, yeah, maybe he's, he's struggled at times, but there is, there is something there and he's, he showed against Portugal or for Portugal, he, he's got a goal in him and, I'm not sure he's a £50 million pound player, but he's he's definitely a, a squad player. I can see him next season, especially in the first part of the season where there's more rotation and more opportunities. I can see him playing a bit of a bigger part. Yeah, to say De Bruyne is never going to be as good is, I'm not sure it's even worth responding to that. Edison, you, City would not be Champions League winners without him. I'd, I've never I've never understood the Edison sort of hate. Yeah, he's... He's maybe not the world's best shot stopper, but what he brings to the team is far outweighs the occasional shot or that he, he lets in or the sort of risks for playing out at the back. I think we're giving this this comment far too much sort of credence, if, if you like. But um, again, Gavardio, mate, too slow. He's playing out of position at left back. He's been caught out a few times, but again, City signed him and said he's a player for 10 years. He's not a player for, for this season. And it's been a fairly solid uh, first season so the, if you want to look at everything negative you can do and you come out with comments like that you could flip it on the head and say these players are only going to get better and that's it and Pep Guardiola wouldn't pick Edison if he was no good you know the, the guy who's yeah. currently the best football manager on the planet if he thinks these players are good enough they're good enough regardless mm-hmm. of what we think do you know what I mean whether they have a good performance or a bad performance if he buys them and keeps picking them they're obviously good enough until he replaces them. <laughs> uh, the last one then, Joe, uh, this was from a Liverpool fan, I assume. It says, Pep spent £180 million in the summer and destroyed the treble winners. What do you think? Are, are we a Liverpool podcast? We are not a Liverpool podcast. I, I've, I've been I, getting a few emails from Liverpool fans not happy and they want more sort of objective, unbiased coverage of <laughs> the Liverpool title race like they find at Liverpool supporting outlets and I'm saying listen like we have colleagues at the Liverpool Echo who do fantastic jobs and if you want Liverpool focused coverage please go there but we write we're we're Manchester Evening News and Manchester City writers and I'm not sure yeah I don't think City fans want to hear what other fans think like that no I agree Um, I just don't it's just it's interesting that we got I think when City played Liverpool we got so many comments about it from Liverpool like salty Liverpool fans thank you to Liverpool fans for listening to our podcast yeah and thank you for commenting because the more you comment and the more you hate comment the more the the higher it goes up the algorithm the more people watch it so you know keep the comments coming but uh, yeah right then Joe back to the Q&A so I'm going to bring in so this is from Roger Artingstall in Cheshire Hi all, love the show. Is there a possibility of you doing more Manchester City podcasts as you're the only one I listen to who actually goes to games as media? Fan channels are great, but I only care for unbiased objection, objectionate, is that a word? I don't know if, I've, if that's a real word, objectionate coverage <laughs> of which the Talking City podcast is the best at. We want more. Joe, how do you respond? I, th- I thought I wrote that quite well, didn't I? I thought... <laughs> uh, no, I mean, yes. Thanks very much. We we will do as much as we can. We do two a week, don't we? And uh, if again, if you like it, keep commenting. If you want to write to our bosses and say you want more more podcasts, then please do so and and see what they say. But uh, yeah, we enjoy doing it. So uh, we'll we'll try and give you that sort of objective, unbiased opinions. And I think we're. We like. I like to think we're quite good at if City aren't good or have made a mistake, we'll we'll say it. We won't just sort of say how great they are as well. So yeah, if if you like that, we'll we'll keep on doing it. Uh, the next one I can't read out because Simon's not here, but it was the one from Monday where you said, um, you know, where Simon's knowledge come from. But Joe, I'm going to flip it to you. So I'm going to say, Joe, where does your wealth of knowledge come from? Ignoring the comment in the article that says Joe knows nothing. Joe knows a lot. <laughs> so 
like how much how much research do you have to put in to all this all this stuff and how do you retain all of that information i think a lot of it is it, it is a full-time job so we we have to be sort of on top of everything but it's it's going to all the press conferences the games and picking up those little things and you might hear something in a press conference that isn't relevant at the time but a few weeks later you you're writing about a player and you think hang, hang on pep said something a while back and it's just been on on top of all that but um i i find sort of talking to people in the academy going to the games talking to the coaches and players is really valuable and i've spoken to a lot of the young players after youth games or just for interviews and suddenly Cole Palmer's playing in the first team and Oscar Bob and uh, sort of, for example, Kian Noble I, I spoke to recently and is a, I, I'll be honest, I didn't know much about him. He's a 17 year old defender playing in the 18s for the first time this season and very articulate, very interesting and gave us a good information on what happens when you when a young player goes up to the first team and also how Guardiola wants his centre-backs to play throughout the club. And then suddenly he's popping up in England training the other day because they need an extra player and he was suspended and he was with the under-17s uh, and he was an extra body and it's it's working out those sort of things. But I think it's talking to as many people as possible, keeping an eye out for everything that, that goes on and even the things that you think are not relevant, they always do become relevant at some point. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's talking to people and just a lot of, my, my partner does not like it, but just a lot of watching football and covering football and, and uh, looking at what is happening in the news and in the world of football. And then the last one, Joe, then this is from Ryan Woods right here in Chatterton. It says, great show. I pass the office on my way to work every day and smile as I think you may be recording as I drive by. Question for you all then. Ask me anything. Pep's future. City are facing 115 charges, as if we didn't know. And Pep has not yet renewed his contract. City announced a deal with CP Company as opposed to Pep's favourite D squared. With City being so on it, in inverted commas, is there a succession plan in place for Pep? Well, I assume that means for Pep Guardiola's exit. Uh, it will be a succession plan. I'm just trying to look at when his contract does expire. I know it's 2025, but... Um, we keep oh, saying 18 months, don't we? So it's probably more like getting towards 12 months now. <laughs> I'm thinking that the actual end date, because according to Transfer Market, it's June the 30th, which is bang in the middle of the World Club Cup. And that's the point I was going to make in that Guardiola almost certainly will not leave before that. He always says when he signs a contract, he will honour it. The end of next season is going to be a really interesting one. That's when all the reports, and we're sort of expecting a decision to have been made on those charges and whether City are guilty or not, what sort of punishment they'll face. Guardiola's gone in front of the media and sort of made it clear he'd manage them in League Two. But if his contract's up, is he gonna is it an easy time for him to walk away and say, listen, it's an, this is clearly a new era for City. If there's a big point deduction, whatever the punishment is, is he able to do it? I think if they were deducted points tomorrow, he would stay and he would see it out. But just logically like he was never going to stay this long anyway so it would be would it is it nine nine years ten years I, I'm trying to work out it would be yeah nine seasons he he would be at the club which is a long long time so I, I, I didn't really have no idea if he will stay or go City obviously will be will have a plan in place of what they want to do or what they, they would do if they got the the news of Guardiola going. I think the Club World Cup will be an interesting one because City have qualified. So does Guardiola stay and try and win that for a second time or does he go beforehand? And then that has a knock-on effect of the summer planning because that summer is going to be completely up in the air. Normally they'd have a few weeks off, a few weeks to make signings and then go on pre-season tour. This time they're going to go straight into a month-long tournament and then have a month off right before the start of the season. So that's going to be an interesting one. Um, so we don't know what's happening with Pep, but the next summer, 2025, is going to be probably one of the biggest in City's recent history for a number of reasons. And then the last one to end then, it's a nice one, simple one. Who are we signing this summer and what positions do we need to strengthen? That's from April Rose. It sounds like Savio or Savino from Troy's slash your owner is wanted and City very interested and there's nothing to suggest that that interest has gone away and 
he only played 10 minutes or so at Wembley for Brazil, but I thought he looked quite sharp and was involved in the Brazil winner and almost set up Hendrik for a, for a second. And he's done very well in La Liga this season. And maybe that hints at a new type of signing. We've spoken about the academy, haven't we? If they want, they, they see the game becoming quicker and quicker and the signing of Jeremy Docker and now Savio potentially is, is it a different type of player than we used to? The sort of slow, tactical, meticulous build-up. Is that going to be replaced by a return to sort of traditional forwards? Um, you got players like Paqueta and uh, and Branthwaite who have been rumoured. I'm not sure they need another centre-back, but I mean, last summer you wouldn't have expected or you might not have expected Laporte to go because every summer you will see players who reassess their options and think you know I'm not I'm not getting many games long term they'll need a replacement for De Bruyne so is net is the summer where you look for a midfielder is Paqueta that that player you know do you look at Walker and Stones and think they're they're getting injured a few times more so Stones and Walker and I mean you can look all around the 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 pitch and left back is always an issue of do they need a left back is this summer going to be going to be the one? So, um, I would expect they will be well underway with the, with the planning. And Savio's an interesting one. Whether he's going to be a first choice starter every week, I'm not sure. But um, I think he's the one that we kind of know already. And then the rest will probably become apparent in the next few weeks and months. Excellent stuff, Joe. Thank you very much for that. Right, we'll leave it there for part two. We'll be back to preview Arsenal as best we can, given the fact that it is Wednesday when we record this. It is Bank Holiday Friday, so there's a lot going on. Uh, But we'll be back in a second for part three. Welcome back to part three of this Talking City podcast. It's Easter weekend, Joe. We're all going to get four days off except you because you're going to be at the Etihad on uh, on the weekend on Sunday, I believe, Easter Sunday. You're going to open all your chocolate eggs, scoff your face, and then head down to the Etihad to go and watch some football, Joe. So, Arsenal, um, uh, we didn't know how the City were playing Arsenal. Uh, Declan Rice came mm-hmm. up to us and said, are you looking forward to the game? And we said, who are you playing? <laughs> so... Um, what do we know? What do we know, John? I know we talked about Arsenal in part one, but uh, in a bit more depth, what do we know? How have Arsenal fared against City recently? I think they haven't beaten City in City at the Etihad in any competition since 2015. Um, so, you know, what do we expect from this game? Uh, first of all, I've got to correct you. I'm not going to be there. I'm uh, I'm on some annual leave. I've got a family thing on uh, on over Easter so Tyrone will be there in our place Um, but yeah City need to win this I think Um, they drew against Liverpool which was a good result that was a sort of must not lose game I think this is closer to a must win in terms of the title race I think it's definitely must not lose because if they lose the four points behind Arsenal they want to keep in in touch but these are the games that affect their other rivals as well and um, we've talked about the defence what state that will be in I'm not sure is it a game where you risk where you sort of rush back players who might not be fully fit or do you for example bring up De Bruyne off the bench if that is better for his for his recovery I think Arsenal have a couple of injury doubts of their own Saka wasn't did he pull out of the England squad or he wasn't included um, he pulled out yeah he pulled out so that's that's an important player for them and they've got a couple of others as well. Um, I think it will be probably closer than the Etihad game last year where City were really hitting their stride, full of momentum, played brilliantly and and De Bruyne was at the heart of it and we later found out was playing with a, a broken hamstring. I think Arsenal probably are a bit more streetwise this year as well. They've beaten City in the league wasn't City's best game that was another game where they were missing a couple of key players like Rodri and weren't fully at their best but Arsenal stuck in there and got a bit of luck with the goal late on and uh, really used that to push on earlier in the season they uh, they got a late late goal in the community shield again not two, two uh, under strength teams but they got that win and they really celebrated like they knew it was a big victory in terms of we've beaten City, we can do it. So City haven't beaten Arsenal in the last two meetings now and they will want to change that. I think, I still think City will edge it, but I don't think it will be a walkover and I think it will be quite tight and nervy and 
when the Liverpool game was full of quality and you could tell it was two teams really at the best, like contrasting styles, that sort of thing. Um, I think this one's going to be a bit more scrappy and it might only be one goal in it. So with that in mind, Joe, and based on what we talked about with all the potential injuries and we don't know the team news thus far, what would your expected 11 be based on the fact that we think Edison might be back and Walker will probably play or, or at least be in the squad? Based on that, what would you? how would you line up? Again, it's hard before we know what Guardiola says on Friday. I'm going to assume that the three players left behind are fit, given that we've seen De Bruyne and Grealish in training. I'm going to assume that Akanji was left out as a precaution rather than any different problem. Um, I don't think they'll risk Stones. Let's say Walker's back because the reports are saying he's maybe 50-50 on or upwards. But again, I'm not sure you risk Walker. So it could be a Kanji at right back, Diaz and Ake in the centre and Guardiola at left back. It's not ideal, but it's it's not a bad back fall. I think to mitigate that, you put Rodri and Kovacic in the midfield, De Bruyne ahead of him, Foden and Bernardo on the wings. Then you can have Grealish come off the bench, maybe. Doku if you need a bit of sort of explosive attacking and then Haaland up front. You, you can bring on an Alvarez as well, even though he's been playing a bit later than everyone else in, in the US in sort of the early hours of Wednesday morning. So he might be a bit more tired. That's not a bad lineup. And I think it's still relatively solid defensively, even without Walker and um, Stones. It could be torn up and start again if Guardiola rules a number of players out on, on Friday. But I get the feeling he's not going to rule anyone out. He's probably going to say, oh, we've, as he always does, we're training to t- today. We've got a couple of training sessions left. Let's go and see, because he, he won't want to give anything away. Um, so I think I think there'll be a few mind games before and Arteta will know exactly what Guardiola does in these situations. And uh, I think Pep will want to keep Arteta guessing as long as possible. And the thing is, Arsenal as well, looking at their at their injury list, there's only three players that are listed as injured, which is Gabriel Martinelli, left winger, Bukayo Saka, right winger, Bukayo Saka, sorry. We, we expect that Saka will play, don't we? So we, we're going to assume that Saka's going to play. So where where is Arsenal's biggest threat to City? Is it is it going to be that Odegaard and Saka combination or, or do you think that there's a threat elsewhere? If, say, Ake has to, be, has to move into the centre and you've got Gavardio there, that could be a a bit of a weak link because Guardiola does like to get forward and can be caught out. Um, again, at Kanji, I think he's a solid right back. Probably maybe more defensive than Walker because Walker does bomb up, but you, you're also losing that sort of width on, on the right. So, um, I mean, Martinelli scored the winner at the Emirates as well and is having a good season. It's, I think it's going to be two good teams and it potentially could be one of those where having a couple of key players out could make it a, a bit of a more even contest as well because you're not relying on just Kevin De Bruyne to make the, the difference or just Bukayo Saka or, for example, who, whoever is playing. it's Someone else has got to step up and, yeah, we've, we've seen that in a few recent games and, yeah, Martinelli did it at, at the Emirates and City have had players like, I don't know, Foden has been their main man this season but he's had to step up in De Bruyne's absence so it could be an example where they need someone else to, to really step up. Yeah, so then with that in mind, Joe, I think you sort of mentioned I think you mentioned one nil maybe earlier, but just to just to push you on a on your expected result. I think yeah, I think one nil because it was one nil in the cup last year at, at the Etihad, it was one nil away at the Emirates in Arsenal's favour. It was only one one in the community shield. That four one last season is a bit of an outlier in the last couple of seasons. So yeah, I, I, it could even be a sort of Harlem penalty if you like. It it could be one of those so I'll say 1-0 and I'll be pleasantly surprised when it's 4-0 or, or equivalent <laughs> well I think Arsenal's motive should be to go there and get an early goal if Arsenal get the early goal yes. the pressure's on City yeah, to yeah. attack and you'll and make I the crowd nervous and that's it yeah. yeah I think if Arsenal come out of the blocks attacking City will need to do something because I think for City to get a draw would obviously depend on the Liverpool result would, would not be 
terrible. But to get a win would obviously be, would take them above Arsenal in the table. And again, depending on how Liverpool do, could potentially take them top of the league. So it's sort of like you say, the mind games are, are going to be there. And and whether City set up defensive before they change to attacking or whether City might come out themselves and just try and take Arsenal to the sword, you know, put Arsenal to the sword early on and, and then leave Arsenal chasing the game. So this is the beauty of football is we don't know what's going to happen, but... But uh, yeah, it's, it's it's going to be a really exciting game. It's a four thirty kickoff, so you've got all weekend to soak up what's happening during the week uh, over the weekend and eat, get your Easter eggs in and uh, and enjoy the football, Joe. But yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna leave it there. Uh, we'll be back on Tuesday. It may be me, or it might be Tyrone, or it might be Joe. Joe, I think you're off next week, are you? I'm still off. Yeah, I'm. Uh... You're still off. So it's going to be the me, Simon, or Tyrone, one of the two, one one combo of the two. But uh, yeah, Joe, thanks for joining me and uh, enjoy your week off and we'll see you on the other side when City are either top of the league, second, third, in in, in contention for the title race, out of contention for the title, <laughs> we don't know. But uh, I mean, just, just lastly, before I go, this question has popped into my head. How important is this game? How important? Like, If you were to, to look at the, the, the last remaining games that City have got, how important is this game for, the, for, for, for City's season? Uh, it's one of the most important because if they lose, it's it's going to be difficult to claw back those four points with all the other games going on. I know Arsenal are in Champions League as well and they've got some difficult fixtures themselves. But as I said before, this is a game where you can, you're not reliant on another team dropping points. You are directly influencing it. And another point we've not even raised is that Arsenal have managed to go quite ahead of City on goal difference. So if City could get a, a few goals, it's it's essentially a chance to sort of chip away at that goal difference and not just, again, not just affect yourself, but every goal you score is sort of effectively two, making the, the gap on goal difference two down every time. So um, I think it's, I think drawing at Liverpool was fine if you beat Arsenal. I think these two, get, the, these two games are very, very important. And then you've got to beat Aston Villa as well, who one at Villa Park and are doing very well and a fourth in the table and have ambitions of their own. So it's a really, really important week, not ideal with the injuries. Um, I'm, I think, I can't remember which player said it, but they said it's not title defining, but it's very, very important. Um, so to have a have a game like this is probably good just to say, right, we, we can't even ease ourselves in to this this period we've just got to go to go at it and uh, yeah before we go as well I'd, I would uh, talk up the fact that the under 18s have a uh, FA Youth Cup semi-final on Tuesday at the uh, Academy Stadium uh, they're playing Bristol City which you would think that they'd win because City have a very good under 18 side but Bristol City have a few good results under their belt this season and uh if they win, they face Leeds or Millwall in the final at home, which is, I mean, that's a cracking semi-final in itself, but they've got a very, very good chance of winning the uh, the Youth Cup this season. So um, I think fans are able to go to that game on Tuesday night or it'll be on the, the City Plus. But uh, there's a there's been a struggle at academy level for the under-21s for a variety of reasons, including injuries, first-team call-ups, player sales over the summer, a revamped Premier League 2 format, but the under-18s are sort of doing the the work when it comes to silverware and could still win a treble. It'll be very hard for them to do, but they could still win both Cups and, and the league. So, uh, yeah, we'll be following that closely as well. Brilliant. Right, Joe, we'll end it there. Thank you for the second time for joining me. Enjoy your week off. And thanks everybody for listening. If you do enjoy the podcast, leave us a five-star review. Get in the comments because we are going to start doing more of what the fans are saying in the comments. We love interacting with you. We get a lot of comments online saying that the Manchester Evening News is so pro-Man United and so anti-City. We want to change that. We want to use this podcast to bring a community of Manchester City fans together, both locally and from afar. Simon and Joe are always reading what you guys are writing under the comments. Simon did a Q&A on Monday, both on the podcast and in the office on an article. So we do read what you say. We might not agree sometimes. We might agree a lot of the time. But listen, we really enjoy what you're saying. We really enjoy you guys getting involved. And we want to, like I say, want to build a community here for Manchester City fans. So do comment, do subscribe, do share. And we will see you next week. Happy Easter. Happy Easter.